Some claim, counterintuitively, that the key to understanding horror films is to imagine the absence of the horror element, and this is what made Hitchcock's work so superb. Norman Bates exemplifies the true characteristics of a psychopath by acting upon thoughts often underlooked in the human psyche. Robert Bloch wrote in a way that pushed the pendulum in the most effective manner to portray a character unrelatable to your everyday audience. A character with a mysterious undertone linked with unacceptable anomalous psychological tendencies. Through unjustifiable actions, he ignored any sign of virtue and exercised unrealistic habits linked with the abnormality of his thoughts. While working through a system of philosophical forms, Robert Bloch created a character with traits linked to an idea of a former neurologist Sigmund Freud. Through an understanding of the unconscious desires, he created a character that rebels against any expected moral ethics of your everyday man, leaving me to the conclusion that Norman was no less of a man than he was an idea of perverse actions personified through human form. As far as ordinary viewers go, some believe The Psycho was written by Alfred Hitchcock himself, but in reality, the film was inspired by Robert Bloch's 1959 book based on the same name. Hitchcock was merely the notable director bringing the book to the silver screen, but in saying that, we can't undermine his work as a director as he was responsible for bringing to life the artistic and dramatic elements that made the film work. Robert Bloch wrote Norman Bates based off of the ever so notorious serial killer Edward Gein. It said that Gein was responsible for horror being where it is now, and that claim holds true if you remember The Psycho was a heavy influence to the genre as a whole, but Robert Bloch created the character of Norman due to the characteristics shown from Gein's psyche. Edward Gein actually lived less than 50 miles from Bloch, and the killings of Ed Gein is what inspired his book. I have yet to touch on Norman's relationship with his mother, but a noteworthy point to make here is the similarity that these two share is their relationship to the mothers. Both Gein and Bates had kept shrines of their dead mothers, and that's kind of where the whole thing came from in Psycho. Right now you might not see the importance of this, but remember, Norman's relationship with his mother was that of a reflection to Gein's relationship with his. Well now that we have Bloch's credit out of the way, we have to mention the man who wrote the screenplay for the film, Joseph Stefano. For the safety of misinformation, take this with a pinch of salt. Supposedly, Stefano's role in bringing the character of Norman Bates to the cinema was merely down to dialogue, and not really substantial enough to deviate from how much work Bloch put into writing Norman's character. While I can't prove this, it has been said before that Stefano didn't really reinvent the wheel in terms of giving Norman a more unique or interesting personal dynamic. Excellence is a very close kin to passion, and passion for Hitchcock is a love of storytelling, communicated in a way that follows a form of psychology fine-tuned from the work of Freud. For Hitchcock's films, he had a conscious view of Freud's unconscious, and through all of his films, they closely work off of ideologies of how the unconscious and conscious mind would work. He had been awarded the name Master of Suspense, and through a career spanning over six decades, he had made a total of 53 films, spawning obscure titles for different genres, and he was really a pioneer for many of the currently used techniques in today's thriller genre. As a team in Hitchcock's work, we see the Freudian concept of repression. Repression is a psychological attempt to direct one's own desires and impulses toward pleasurable instincts by excluding them from one's consciousness and holding on to them or subduing them in the unconscious. And this will occur in most of his films. His work will often contain elements of suspense and arousal, and a key word to note when looking at Hitchcock's work is precedentment. Something that Hitchcock does well is creating an intuitive feeling about the future, especially one of foreboding. This is especially noticeable when you look at the character of Marion. She's a free, ambitious woman and the first half of the film is set up well enough that we feel like the film has to end off with wherever her destination is, but it doesn't. The narrative was flipped and turned around on the audience. She had no destination. While discussing the idea of suspense, what horror lacks nowadays is everything that Hitchcock excelled in. Firstly, as a bit of clarification, Psycho isn't necessarily a horror film. At least in my opinion, it's not a conventional horror film. While horror nowadays, they contain jump scares and loud noises for practical application. It's true cheap writing that they scare an audience, but Hitchcock never entertained any of the norms that we see in today's horror. As of right now, suspense tends to be created in the form of dark hallways, eerie music getting progressively louder, and disfigured creatures jumping out from behind a door. But what made Hitchcock stand out was his ability to employ a type of psychological suspense. And while yes, horror nowadays can produce the same type of suspense, it's often underdone. Some claim, counterintuitively, that the key to understanding horror films is to imagine the absence of the horror element, and this is what made Hitchcock's work so superb. I want to put emphasis on the importance of Hitchcock's work in Psycho as yes, Bloch did write the story, but it was through the work of intelligent symbolism that Hitchcock added so many intricate layers to Psycho. If you study film or you have a key eye for symbolism, you would have noticed the prominent use of birds in Psycho, and this is an obvious symbol but it's actually really deep in itself. It was thanks to Hitchcock that he was able to incorporate visual metaphors in the narrative of Bloch's story. An important thing to recognize is that usually, visual framework is always intentional. 
There's something called a rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is the process of dividing an image into thirds, using two horizontal and two vertical lines. And this imagery grid yields nine parts with four intersection points. And when you position the most important elements of your image at these intersection points, you produce a much more natural image. And when looking at Hitchcock's use of birds in Psycho, he followed the rule of thirds carefully, meaning that everything we see in the mise-en-scene is vital to the story and is a symbol of something deeper. It's said that birds, regardless of shape and size, can become prey to a bigger and more domineering species. And the symbolism with the bird in Psycho is that Marion Crane was the prey and Norman Bates was the predator. Interestingly enough, the crane is a family of birds. Marion Crane, the crane birds, once again suggesting that Marion was the prey. Bait can also be used as, uh, you know, catching bait. You know, Norman Bates, catching bait. Was Marion the prey and Norman was the bait? If you recall watching the first scene in Psycho, it opens up on a bird's eye view. This establishing shot is important as it reveals that it's in Phoenix, Arizona. In ancient Greek folklore, a phoenix is a long-lived bird. This is Hitchcock's first use of the bird symbol in Psycho. And it becomes ever so obvious when Marion and Norman sit down in the office for lunch. Norman quickly reveals that one of his passions is stuffing birds, which is quite weird. But during their brief conversation, Norman tells Marion that she eats like a bird. And while simultaneously sitting next to a songbird, songbirds are among the few weaker and defenseless birds, thus insinuating that Marion is such like the species easy to dominate playing into Norman's mentality of being the aggressor. The ways in which Hitchcock angled his shots have a deeper meaning that some people wouldn't normally pick up on. In this medium level shot, it shows Norman has an equal presence on screen. It's not hyper-focused on the surroundings, but it's more so equal to himself and what's going on behind him. This angle suggests that Norman's in a state of calm, more laid back so than anything. But as Norman begins getting more hostile on the topic of his mother, the angle changes and behind him is an owl. Owls are taught to be hidden in the shadows and in this shot, there's a long shadow cast from the owl. If something or someone casts a long shadow over something or someone, that sounds so funny to say it, but that's what I meant to write, they have a great or long lasting influence over them, usually a bad one. That was so funny. Alongside this, in cinematography, a low angle shot is a shot from a camera angle positioned low on the vertical axis, anywhere below the eye line looking up. Psychologically, the effect of the low angle shot is that it makes the subject look strong and powerful. And as Norman sits back down, we have a wide angle of his face, and the camera stays close, alluding to a level of intensity for the audience. From these shots, there seems to be two different types of birds. Docile birds, which would be known to be the submissive birds, and the predatory birds. This is easily interpreted as a visual implementation of the split personality of Norman Bates. Hitchcock used symbolism to add extra depth to an already stable story. There is simply not enough time on my schedule or your schedule to explain every semiotic in Psycho. That's merely just one of them. It's said that Hitchcock's films follow the Freytag pyramid narrative theory. And for those that don't know what a narrative theory is, I'm gonna briefly explain it. The triac structure. These are films which have been written on a linear structure, meaning it has a beginning, the introduction to the character, the middle, the conflict that the characters are introduced to, and the resolution, the climax of the film. The next one is a non-linear narrative storytelling. In the most rudimentary sense, a non-linear narrative is a story that unfolds in no chronological order, meaning that the story doesn't follow any particular structure. This style of structuring was implemented during the French New Wave, and most films utilize this narrative by having flashbacks and timeline jumps. An easy example of this narrative being put to action is Forrest Gump 1994. The way this film played out had no chronological order at all, as Ferris Gump told stories to strangers while waiting at a bus stop. So while Ferris Gump did start with stories from a young age, he jumped from being an adult to a kid and he essentially started from the end and told the story from the beginning, making a story unfolding through a non-linear narrative. The next one is Tezatan Todorov's circular narrative. Todorov was known for being a structuralist and a literary theorist. He was known for creating narrative theories often found in books, plays and many of films. A film structured upon a circular narrative can be quite easy to predict. With the circular narrative theory, the story will always end where it had begun, but it's what happens after the state of equilibrium has been disrupted and before it's restored that makes each story unique. Throughout this life-changing journey, the character tends to face moral obstacles that sees them grow, but always back where they started with a new and most times better found lease on life. This character will undergo a personal transformation which always introduces better insight into them as people. You see how they handle situations when faced with hardships. Finally, leaving us with the final narrative, the Freytag Pyramid. Devised by 19th century German playwright Gustav Freytag, Freytag's pyramid is a paradigm of dramatic structuring, outlining the seven key steps in storytelling. Number one, exposition. A comprehensive description and explanation of an idea or theory. Insight and incident. The inciting incident launches the story's action and sends the protagonist on a journey. Rising action. Rising action is a literary term used to describe an important part of a story. Every type of story from a novel or TV show uses rising action to keep audiences engaged. The climax. The highest or most intense point in the development or resolution of something. The culmination. A decisive moment that is of maximum intensity or a major turning point in the plot. 
Falling action. Falling action is what happens near the end of a story after the climax and resolution of the major conflict. The majority of literary and dramatic works are built on action, characters doing things, typically pursuing what they want. And the final one is resolution. The resolution is also known as the noment, and is the conclusion of the story's plot when the conflicts are resolved and the story concludes. This is the narrative most commonly used in Hitchcock's work. But to make matters more complicated, and I know they kind of already are, I have to mention how Hitchcock didn't follow this theory in a conventional way. With this theory in mind, Hitchcock applied an inverted U function, and in terms of psychology, which we all know Hitchcock loves, it means this, a proposed correlation between motivation or arousal, and performance such that performance is porous when motivation or arousal is at a very low or very high state. This function is typically referred to as the yerkes dodson law. Basically, he uses this function to explain the relation between arousal and behavioral capability, and this can be noticed in Psycho as Norman Bates' behavior changes drastically as he becomes sexually attracted to Marion. Now applying psychoanalytic theory to Psycho explains exactly how Norman's mind works. Cinema can be seen as a reflection of postmodern society, especially having a sociological impact through the art and stories of the director. And how that applies to Psycho is that Psycho exists in a world that is a belief in Freud's psychoanalytic studies. It's very likely you've heard of the influential but controversial founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. He entered medical school and trained to become a neurologist, earning a medical degree in 1881. Soon after his graduation, he set up a private practice and began treating patients with psychological disorders. His attention was captured by a colleague's intriguing experience with a patient. The colleague was Dr. Joseph Brower, and his patient was the famous Anna O, oh, who suffered from physical symptoms with no apparent physical cause. Dr. Brower found that her symptoms abated when he helped her recover memories of a traumatic experience that she had repressed or hidden from her conscious mind. And this case sparked Freud's interest in the unconscious mind and spurred the development of some of his most influential ideas. Now, this leads us to Freud's theory on the Oedipus slash Electra complex. Essentially, the Oedipal complex is a term used by Sigmund Freud in his theory of psychosexual stages of development, and it is generally a term for both Oedipus and electrical, electrical, <laughs> electric complexes. Oh my God, electrical complexes, that's gas. So the Oedipal complex is a theory of Sigmund Freud and occurs during the phallic stage of psychosexual development. It involves a boy aged between three and six becoming unconsciously sexually attracted to his mother and hostile towards his father, who he views as a rival. And the Electra complex is a term used to describe the female version of the Oedipus complex, and it involves a girl, aged between three and six, becoming unconsciously sexually attracted to her father and increasingly hostile towards her mother. So, how does this apply to Norman Bates? As we all know, and spoiler alert if you haven't seen the ending of the film, because if you haven't, you really shouldn't be watching this video, Norman was found to have killed his mother when she introduced another man into her life. He, or technically as Blotch wrote it, she, Norman, murdered both his mother and his stepfather. Now, to understand the inner workings of his mind, we need to remember what Freud said about the components of the tree personality complex. According to Sigmund Freud, the human personality is complex and it has more than one single component. In his famous psychoanalytic theory, Freud states that the personality is composed of three elements known as the id, the ego, and the superego. These elements work together to create the complex human behaviors. In the most simplest of forms, the id is this, I want to do that. The ego is this, well maybe we can make a compromise, and the superego is, it wouldn't be right to do that. When talking about the psychoanalytic theory to my tutor, he put it in a very funny way. When you have a donut, you might subconsciously desire the donut, and that's because it brings you instant gratification, and you eat it. But your ego will tell you, you know what, maybe no one else in the house wants the donut, so why don't they just eat it? But the superego will say, well sure, I've already had so many donuts recently, maybe I'll just leave it for someone else. Remove the donut analogy and apply that to Norman Bates. Essentially, this theory represents more than we would think. If you look at the poster, you can see the big ominous house overlooking the hotel. Well, that's Norman's subconscious, and the hotel is his consciousness. At least, that's the way I interpret it. Also worth mentioning is the house has three floors. Hitchcock intentionally chose this house, first invented through Edward Hopper's 1921 painting, and used each floor as a sort of level of personality for Norman, each one being different, and this was intentional. Why did Norman kill Marion? Essentially, Norman built up sexual attraction for Marion and due to this felt guilty because his mother really wouldn't want another woman in his life. So, he had to murder her. One of Norman's personalities is quite obviously that of his mother's, hence why he dressed like her. He truly believed he was her for moments and he didn't even realize that he killed Marion. In other words, Marion was a tool place into Norman's life for Blotch to create a character stuck living in the exact theory that Freud had originally written about. And while her story was important, she was only a vice for Norman to snap and exercise those traits from each personality. I believe Hitchcock intended for us to interpret this way. Norman believed he was his mother. 
He created a character with such a strong story linked with Freud's theory that it over explains it in a way that the audience could pick up on. And it was slow, and it did take a while, but the ending made sense as we all subconsciously knew of Freud's writings anyway. We've all heard, and, and maybe true poor paraphrasing, the idea that we're secretly attracted to the parent of our opposite sex. Hitchcock just interestingly took that idea and executed it perfectly. It makes me wonder how alike Norman and Marion really are. I mean, five letters in each name. Norman's life was a polar opposite of Marion's was, if you kind of think about it. He was locked into one life while she wanted to explore another one. Also, remember the scene in which Marion randomly smiles in the rain? It's eerily similar to Norman's smile at the end of the film. I don't know, I feel like Hitchcock never really, you know, uh, touched on that, but I feel like there is a bit of a, uh, you know, like a linking between those two characters. They're kind of very similar in the most opposite way if that makes sense it doesn't make sense but it, it makes sense to me <laughs> it makes sense to me uh, we all interpret things differently but these are the fundamental elements that were taken into account when Blatcher originally wrote his book and Hitchcock had a major attraction to the story because it truly fit his style as a director what are your thoughts on Psycho let me know in the comments below and just to clarify at the end here I've been away from the YouTube stuff for the last year um, because I've been focusing on college and just life's been pretty hectic and stuff but I'm gonna get back into it I'm gonna have another video out in the next week it's gonna be a very creepy Christmas special one but this was the most fun I've ever had making a video I think this is the best writing I've done and it's kind of all thanks to college for like allowing me to be able to do it so thank you for listening and yeah have a nice day